thank you so much for sharing your time with us today for this NCAR Explorer series lecture, When You Need Darkness to See the Light, Total Solar Eclipses with Dr. Paul Bryans. I am Dr. Evie McCumber, and I am an educator here at the National Center for Atmospheric Research, or NCAR. NCAR is a world-leading organization dedicated to understanding Earth system science, including our atmosphere, weather, climate, the sun, the sun, so I'm excited for this, and the importance of all of these systems to our society. Um, I am really glad that y'all are joining us today to learn about how total solar eclipses have captured the heart of solar scientists. For this event, you will be able to ask Paul questions following the lecture, and Aliyah will help moderate so that we can ensure that we hear from both our in-person and our virtual audience. If you're here, just raise your hand. Aliyah's gonna bring a mic. There is an Aliyah. I know you can't see her, but she's somewhere. Um, when you get the mic, make sure that you point it at your mouth so that the people online can hear you. Okay. Um, if you're joining us virtually, um, you can ask your questions using the Slido platform. Um, for a virtual audience, if you scroll down this web page, you can see the Slido window just below where you're seeing this live stream. And if you haven't already, for our online audience, go ahead and click on the green Join Event button, and then you can ask questions on the Q&A tab. Paul also has some really interesting poll questions for us. So for both our in-person and virtual audience, please respond on Slido. If you are in person, I know that we have been having some issues with getting into Slido, so if we can please bring that QR code back so I can give you some time to get into Slido. Yay! So if you can go ahead and get the QR code going so you can log in. Um, please make sure that you're using your phone to navigate to um, this web page. Yay! Um, and make sure you are joining Slido because we want to hear your thoughts with regards to our word cloud, which is going to be asking, what do you think of when you hear the words solar eclipse? Because we are really going to get to that very soon. In case you want to rewatch this event later, uh, it's going to be recorded and will be available on the NCAR Explorer series website. With us today, we have NCAR scientist Paul Bryans. Paul is a scientist at the High Altitude Observatory at NCAR, where he researches the ways the sun affects life on Earth. To do this, he uses observations from many different telescopes, both on the ground and in space, which each give unique perspectives on how the sun's atmosphere is evolving. Dr. Bryans has been involved with field expeditions to observe solar eclipses since 2017, including leading a team to a mountaintop in Chile. In addition to solar research, Paul has also conducted research in the fields of supernova remnants, molecular clouds, and comets. Now, before I turn it over to Paul, um, let's check out your thoughts on a word cloud. So if Jesse and Christopher could please share a slide for us, and I give you Paul. Come on, Paul. So thank you, Evie, for that kind introduction. You might have been listening to what she said and think, why does someone who gets paid to study the sun have the authority to come up here and talk about the one time where we don't even see the sun? So um, I have to start off with a confession, and that's that this talk is not really about total solar eclipses at all. Um, it's about the sun. So I feel like it's false advertising. Aliyah's not locked the doors yet, so feel free to, <laughs> to leave if you came for some other reason. But I will touch on eclipses and how eclipses help us understand the sun. Um, can we move back to the slides? Okay, so let's start with, let's get away from eclipses and start with when we actually can see the sun. If you look up at the sun right now, which you shouldn't do unless you're wearing protective glasses, you'll see something like this, right? This is what we call the photosphere of the sun. This is the visible part that you would see with your eyes. Um, for 
There are some features on it, but for the most part, it's kind of plain and boring. But the sun's actually made up of many different layers. Um, in the core of the sun, um, atoms are, are pushed together with gravity, right? And hydrogen atoms fuse together to create helium. But it also creates a lot of energy. And that energy um, eventually um, is forced out from the center and eventually gets to the surface which is the photosphere that we just saw in the previous slide. But it doesn't stop there, right? It keeps going. It moves out into uh, the sun's atmosphere that we call the corona. Um, so if we can move now to a couple of the, the slidal questions. Um, these were kind of designed just to kind of gauge your, what the people's background knowledge is on, on the sun. Um, and one question was uh, on, whether you think the corona is hotter than the surface of the sun um, or cooler. Um, and then I forget what the other one was, something to do. Oh yeah, here we go. So most people think that the corona is warmer than the surface of the sun and a lot warmer. Uh, most people are correct. Uh, but I want you to take a minute to stop and think about, does that really make sense? Right, if I, let's make an analogy with a campfire, right? If I'm out camping and I'm making s'mores, do I, and I, if, do I want my marshmallow close to the surface of that fire to, to melt or, or, or do I want to move it away? If I move my marshmallow away, nothing's going to happen, right? But it seems to be the opposite thing is happening on the sun, right? The surface is much cooler than the atmosphere. And when I say cooler, the surface is still 6,000 degrees, right? It's hot. But the corona is a million degrees. So, so why, why would that be? And that's, that's something that we solar physicists still don't really understand. Right? We're, we're, we're trying to, part of what I'm trying to get across in this talk is um, our observations will, um, are, are trying to go towards answering that question. Um, so the, the, the next slide question was to do with um, how the sun can affect life on Earth. Um, and I think there are, effect, effect power grids is the correct answer here, um, but wipe out internet services, I would say is also correct, right? You kind of need power for your, for your internet. Um, it, as far as we know, it cannot create tsunamis and the planet is still here, so it has not destroyed the planet yet. Um, but, all of these effects are driven um, not, really, not by the surface of the sun, but by the sun's atmosphere, the corona. And that part uh, we can only see during eclipses. So let's go back to the other slides now. OK, so I spoke about when the material reaches the surface of the sun, it doesn't stop there. It comes out and it forms an atmosphere that we call the corona. Um, that corona is not some steady environment, right? This is a kind of, you can see the surface of the sun on the left here and the material is flowing away. Um, and that, we call this the solar wind. It eventually reaches the earth. It can interact with the earth and cause the things that we spoke about on that Slido comment, such as um, destroying the planet. Um, <laughs> this kind of looks like it's a nice, smooth, flow and it's kind of um, easy to understand. But it's not always the case. Um, sometimes you can get large eruptions happening. Um, and these are the type of things, if it is directed towards the Earth, really cause problems on Earth. Um, and so I kind of would like to go back to the campfire analogy a little bit now. Um, if, would you see this sort of thing on a campfire? No, everything is kind of like, on, on the surface of the fire, yeah, you might see like kind of little undulations, right? But when you move out into the atmosphere of the fire, nothing really happens. It's just kind of warmer and getting cooler as you move away. But there's all this structure that you see in the sun. And the difference between a campfire and the sun is that the sun is magnetic. Um, and I'm not going to go into any details on the sun's magnetism here. If you're a kind of regular, 
uh, at these Explorer events. Um, Rebecca Centeno gave a really nice talk on this subject um, a few years ago. So, and if you, if you haven't seen that, it's on the NCARS website. You can watch the recording. I encourage you to do it. It's a much more interesting talk than the one I'm giving now. Um, <laughs> but part of our research is, can we not just measure the corona, but measure the magnetic field? Um, if I take a fridge magnet um, and I, I kind of throw it into the campfire, nothing happens, right? It'll get hot, it'll melt. Um, but, it's, but nothing's really going to happen because the campfire is not magnetic. If I take that same fridge magnet and throw it at the sun, uh, it's going to melt a lot faster, for one, but it'll also be deflected, right? The magnetic field will move it in all different ways. But if you think about that fridge magnet, if you take it up to your fridge, let's take a more sensible example, um, you can feel it being attracted to the fridge, right? But you can't see the magnetic field that is causing that attraction, right? So we need to kind of get creative in the ways to image the magnetic field. And I'll kind of get to that a little bit uh, later. Um, okay, so what happens when this solar wind flows away from the sun and gets towards the Earth? Um, I think there is this this understanding um, of the sun is our star, but it's some distant object, right? I'd prefer actually to think of the sun not as a distant object, but as something that we live inside of. If you think of the corona and its extension, um, we're inside the solar wind right now. Thankfully, the Earth has a magnetic field of its own that deflects most of this uh, particles when they're coming, and they don't really impact us too much. Um, but sometimes they do. And that's what's shown in this figure. And the, you, you can see here the, the kind of circular shapes are, are, are outlining what the magnetic field looks like. So on the right, you see the magnetic field of the Earth. That deflects most of the particles coming from the sun. Um, but the particles from the sun have magnetic field of their own, and if they're oriented in the right direction, um, like you see here, they can kind of sneak in a little bit. They can break through the Earth's magnetic field and cause sometimes things that are nice, like the aurora, but also they can cause some problems, like um, GPS satellites can be disrupted by them, uh, radio uh, communications can be disrupted, the power grid can be impacted, etc. Okay, so let's uh, talk about how do we measure, or how do we predict space weather? And I think it's useful to kind of make an analogy with Earth weather. Um, if, you, if, this, if you sent a satellite up into space and you observed the Earth like this, do you think you could predict what the weather would be like tomorrow? Yes? Well, okay, so what would the weather be like tomorrow? My answer is no, because what this is showing is the surface of the Earth, right? I can't tell what the weather's like without looking at the atmosphere of the Earth. So I really need something like this that shows the Earth's atmosphere. Um, and it's the same with the sun, right? I can't predict the sun's weather just by looking at the surface of the sun. That's what we see here. But the problem is that the sun is different from the Earth because the sun's surface is a million times brighter than the sun's atmosphere. That's not true for the Earth, right? We can see the clouds right now just by looking up in the sky. But if I look at the sun, the brightness of the surface of the sun drowns out everything else and I can't see its atmosphere unless I have an eclipse. And that blocks out all that brightness and suddenly I can see the sun's atmosphere. So what you're seeing here is the corona. Um, and Actually, how we discovered the sun had a corona at all was through solar eclipses. This was the first, this was the first way anyone could ever see them. Um, they didn't actually know it was the corona to begin with. There was a lot of theories going around. What are they seeing? One of the early theories hundreds of years ago was that we are seeing the moon's atmosphere. This is the sunlight passing through the atmosphere of the moon getting to us. Um, but we now know that the moon doesn't have an atmosphere, or not much of one, certainly nothing that can create this. Um, so, so we eventually realized that this was the atmosphere of the sun that we were, that we were seeing. Um, so before I start this, actually, let's go back 
and go to the Slido questions on, on what people's thoughts are on, on eclipses. Because I'm going to transition now into the part of the talk that you actually came here for and talk about eclipses and how they happen. And... All right, so how often do solar eclipses occur? This is a little bit of a loaded question, right? Because what is a solar eclipse? There are, there are different types of solar eclipse. Um, I'll get into that in a minute. Um, so yes, every, the majority of people are right to say that um, solar eclipses happen every year. They're not all the same. Some are annular, some are partial, some are total. Um, a total solar eclipse happens on average about once every 18 months. Um, but the reason I put every month is because that may be something that seems intuitively correct, right? The moon orbits the Earth once a month, right? So surely it just gets in front of the sun once a month and we would get an eclipse every month. Um, that's not true, and I'll, I have so, I'll, I'll show you why in a second. Um, I think there's another question here, am I right? Okay, how far into the future will total solar eclipses end? Um, I think most people think in many, many millions of years, but there's quite a lot of people who think they will never end. Um, the answer is, well, actually, I'll leave you. I'll wait. Let's go back to the slides and, and you'll find out the answer. <laughs> okay, so let's talk about why eclipses happen. The simple answer is that the moon gets between the Earth and the sun. Um, but think about this for a second. If you look up into the sky, the moon and the sun look roughly the same size. That feels like something we take for granted, but it's actually it's just a coincidence, right? The, the sun is 400 times farther away than the moon is, but it's also 400 times bigger than the moon, so they just so from our vantage point, they look the same size in the sky. Um, and that's really awesome because it means when the moon gets in front of the sun, it covers it just perfectly. Um, and this image here, this is not to scale, right? The sun's actually much further away. So this makes it look like half of the globe should be eclipsed when you do get an eclipse, right? Eventually, this movie's going to zoom out. This is at 28 to 1 scale to actual 1 to 1 scale. And you can see that that shadow of the moon is really small, right? So that's why when you get an eclipse on Earth, it only passes over a really small localized area um, on the Earth, and you need to travel to, to get to it. Um, okay, so get to this question about why does, it, why does it not happen every month? The moon orbits the Earth every month, um, but the moon's orbit is not on the same plane as the Earth's orbit around the sun, right? It's inclined a little bit, and you can see that here. So sometimes when it's between the moon and the Earth, it's actually up above, and sometimes it's down below. So that, that's why it doesn't happen every month. Um, but then there's another complication as well, um, and that is that the moon does not orbit the Earth in a perfect circle. It's, a, it's, it's, it's almost a circle, but it's actually an ellipse. Um, when it's closest to the Earth, it looks a little bit bigger in the sky to us than when it's at apogee, when it's farther from the Earth. So if an eclipse happens when the moon is closer to apogee, that means that the moon is actually smaller than the sun in the sky, and it that's when you get a so-called annular eclipse, right? The moon covers the sun, but not entirely, and you have this ring of fire around. Um, when it's near perigee, the moon is as big or a little bit bigger than the sun, and it covers the entire thing. So when you add all of these things together, you get a total solar eclipse, not once a month, but on average, once every 18 months. And it varies, it kind of, the inclination of the moon, the exactly where it is in the orbit, kind of all goes together to, figuring out when and where this will happen. Um, OK, so let's get to our question on will eclipses ever end? I think, um, yes, clearly they'll end because you think, one, one reason you thought they might end in many millions of years is because you think the sun might explode, right? And that's true, but that, that'll be many billions of years. Actually, it's 600 million years. Um, and the, how we know this is that the Apollo astronauts took up reflectors to the moon. This is Buzz Aldrin here. 
installing the first one. So they left them on the moon, and then now we can fire laser beams at those reflectors. They reflect back, and we measure how long it takes the light to get there and come back. And by measuring that time, we know very precisely how far away the moon is. It turns out the moon is moving away from the Earth at about one and a half inches per year. So it's slow, right? But one and a half inches per year times 600 million years means the moon will eventually be too small to cover the sun, and you'll never get a total solar eclipse again. So take your chance now. You've only got 600 million years before you, they will never happen. OK, so if total solar eclipses are so awesome for science and for being able to predict space weather, um, there is also a problem with them. Three problems, really. One, they only happen every 18 months, right? If I want to predict the weather every day, I don't want observations once every 18 months, right? The weather channel would go out of business. The other thing is they only last a few minutes, right? So I can't get a continuous observation. Um, and then this third thing is that they're not everywhere on Earth. They're very localized, and you have to travel oftentimes to remote places to see them. So why did science, scientists kind of thought, why don't we just make fake eclipses that happen all the time? And that was our final Slido question I asked about. Um, and it is, when did scientists actually make this happen? Um, so there is a whole range of answers here, right? Um, I think two of these answers are actually correct. One correct answer is the 1930s, when they first made um, a telescope that kind of could simulate an eclipse. But I think, don't be silly, they can't do that, is also correct, because I'll get to the fact that these instruments are not really an eclipse. The, like, there's nothing really can emulate an eclipse. So if we go back to the other slides now, oh, people are changing their minds. Yeah. <laughs> OK. So, you, so, so you, you would think, in principle, I'm going to build a telescope and point it at the sun. Why don't I just make a fake moon, right? Oh, I'll make a little disk, and I'll put it in front of my telescope. It will be the exact same size as the sun. I'll block out all the sunlight. I'll get an eclipse. Uh, conceptually, that sounds simple, but in practice, it's very hard to do. And a reason or a way to understand why it's so hard is let's say you go outside just now and you put your thumb up to the sun. You can block out the sun, right? You wouldn't see it. You would be able to look up there and not be blinded. But would that be the same as an eclipse? Do you think you would be getting the same experience? No. no. Yeah, exactly. Um, and the reason for that is that the sunlight is still coming into the Earth's atmosphere. It's scattering off all the Earth's atmosphere and still getting to your eyes. So the same thing happens with a telescope, right? If I put a fake moon in front of the telescope, all this other light still gets in there. But if you're very clever, this kind of move. There we go. If you're very clever about how you build this telescope, you can get around this, these scattered light effects, right? You put that fake moon inside your telescope, not outside. You have lots of ways to block out the scattered light um, that are kind of technical and not really very interesting. But the first guy that actually made this happen was um, a guy called Bernard Leo. That's him down in the, does this got a thing? That's him there, down he, uh, on the bottom right. Um, he was a French guy, and he made this happen in the 1930s. People had tried before, but kind of couldn't get their instrumentation to work. Um, then there was a guy from around here, from the Rockies, uh, Donald Menzel. And he traveled to Europe. He met Bernard Leo, and he thought, this is awesome. Why don't we make one in America? So he came back here, and he hired a guy called Walter R. Roberts, who you might have heard of because this building's named after him. And he was the first director of NCAR. He eventually started this whole organization. Anyway, Menzel hired Walt Roberts and said, build me one of these here. So what he did was he went to Climax, which if you're from around here, you might know it's up, it's kind of near Leadville up uh, to the west. Um, he chose that site because it's high in the, in the high altitude, right? The higher in the Earth's atmosphere you get, kind of there's less, less of the Earth's atmosphere messing with your observations. So he wanted to go up to as high an elevation as possible. Um, 
And this was already, um, I lived in a mine at that point, so he kind of worked out a deal with the miners. Can I take a little bit of your land and build a telescope here? Um, this is him with his wife just kind of going to work in the morning, I guess. It's kind of <laughs> snowy up there. Um, and it was kind of a lot of work, but he eventually got it to work. And this is him. This is actually one of his observations in the 1940s. Um, he did a lot of other stuff. Uh, when this in the in the forties, a lot of the driving behind having one of these in the U.S. back then is because this was during the Second World War, right? And the Allies were communicating with radio communications back then. Um, if you remember earlier on, I said that um, radio communications is one of the things that can be impacted by space weather. So they wanted to know when to send their radio communications that would not be interrupted. So if he saw something like this happening, he would tell them this is not a good time, your radio is going to be interfered with. And um, that, was, that was a lot of the, the practical use of, <coughs> excuse me, of, the, of these observations back then. Um, in the 1970s, that site in Climax was decommissioned kind of, for a couple of reasons. One was that they were still mining there, right? It made the air kind of dirty with a lot of other stuff that was not good for trying to do solar observations. Um, I think, in, and they built a new uh, observatory in Hawaii. So I think the second reason was the weather is much better. Um, and this is our site, the Mauna Loa Observatory, that's still currently running uh, when we don't have volcanic activity. Um, and this is an example of the observations we can take today. Um, so they're, they're not quite as good as an eclipse. Uh, but they're pretty close. And more importantly, we can take them not 24 hours a day, but about five hours a day. You need, obviously you can't take this in nighttime, right? You, um, and you, you need the sun to be up, but you, if the sun's too close to the horizon, it also doesn't work very well. You've got Earth's atmosphere to contend with. Um, but even though we had these observations uh, using these so-called coronagraphs, um, they still went on eclipse expeditions. So this was the first one, the NCAR. It wasn't called NCAR back then, but it's what became NCAR, um, led to Sudan. And one thing I want to point out is, look at how huge these things are, right? I'm amazed that they took this stuff like all over the world for a four minute observation. Um, they went to the Cook Islands in 1958. They kind of, I mean, they, you don't really have a choice where to go, right? The eclipse happens where it happens, but they kind of got lucky, I think, with some of these uh, <laughs> locations. Um, and then in Bolivia here, and I want to point this one out because if you see this telescope here that they have behind the curtain, the little bit Wizard of Oz, right? Um, that's the same telescope that you see out in the lobby here. That's the New Kirk telescope. Um, it was designed, um, and it has a very interesting design and in there's special filters in it that kind of attenuate the light um, differently as you move away from the sun so that you don't get dominated by the bright stuff that is close to the sun. You, can, you get a kind of even picture where you see the corona spread all the way out as far as your field of view is. Um, and they took this telescope to many different places for, for, for decades. Um, this is it again in Mexico. Um, more recently, uh, this was the last solar eclipse that was in the US. We took much smaller stuff you can see this time. We packed this up and put it in the back of the van and drove it there. I can't imagine like taking this huge apparatus anywhere. Um, and then most recently, we went to, to Chile in 2019. Um, so the question is, if we have this instrumentation in Hawaii now, and, then, and there are other of these coronagraph telescopes around the world, that can fake an eclipse, why do we still bother with eclipses at all? My answer is I like to go to Chile and places like that, right, it's fun. <laughs> but the reason that I tell my boss is because if I compare my eclipse observation with a coronagraph observation, they're not really comparable. Here's, here this, this is observations from the same day, right? This is the eclipse that was taken in 1980 uh, in India. And here's what the Mauna Loa instrument took um, in Hawaii that same day. You can see that the, the, the quality isn't so much better here, right? And it's not just the quality. If you also, if you look, um, 
this dotted line that you see kind of inside the black square, that's where the sun is. So this so-called fake moon that they put in front of the telescope, they have to make it a little bit bigger than the sun. If they make it the exact same size, there's too much sunlight scatters in. So you can't really do, this, do the same thing. The, the difference with the moon is that it's so far away, it's outside the Earth's atmosphere, right? It blocks all that light before it even gets to the Earth. So you don't need to worry about that scattered light. You do need to worry about it if you're doing your fake eclipse. In the, so, so you can't see really low down in the corona the same way as you can with an, a, with an eclipse. Um, and then here's again another example from 2017. You can see that our observatory observations now are better than they were before, but they're still not as good as the eclipse. So we still like to go on eclipse expeditions. Um, but one drawback of the eclipse is that it only happens for, and okay, so this, this is the 2024 eclipse. It will happen in April next year. It will last four minutes. The maximum time an eclipse can happen is about nine minutes, right? So you, you only get a few minutes of observations. And to try and predict space weather, you want to see observations over a long period of time, see how things are changing in the corona, are things being ejected? Um, so if we have one telescope in the path of the eclipse, the shadow moves over us, we see the corona for four minutes, and then we're done. But what if we're kind of clever, and instead of having one telescope, we have lots of telescopes all along the eclipse path? Um, the key to this is making sure that all of these telescopes are exactly the same, right? Because if I want, if I take 35 four-minute images and stitch it all together, I kind of want a seamless movie. I don't want kind of the exposure changing, the everything changing. So that's what we are doing for next year. We're deploying 35 of these eclipses all the way from Texas up to Maine. Um, they will be spaced so closely together that there is never any gap, right? So they'll, they'll be all along the eclipse path. Uh, and then after the fact, we'll stitch a movie together that each individual one is four minutes, but total movie is an hour. And then you can really see things changing in the corona over that time. So here's all the locations where the um, telescopes will be. Um, we do not have enough scientists to, this, is, this is an example. We did some tests in Australia this year, and this is kind of an example of what you would see uh, with this instrumentation. Uh, we don't have enough scientists to man all these stations, so we're engaging the community to do it, right? Uh, if you are going to be near the eclipse path and you want to be involved in this project, let us know. There's an um, email address there. Um, and you, don't worry about grabbing it right now. You can talk to me after if you're interested. Um, but the cool thing is that we're trying to engage underserved communities, and we are giving them all the equipment to keep after the fact. So this stuff is not just nice for looking at eclipses. It can be used for nighttime astronomy, for, for different things. Um, the other problem with eclipses is that um, if you're viewing it from the Earth, I might have clouds. Right? And then I don't see anything. You don't get to kind of keep observing, oh, maybe the clouds will go away. The eclipse happens when it happens. That's nothing you can control. So one idea is to get above those clouds in an aircraft. This is an uh, um, aircraft called a WB-57. This used to be a military bomber. Um, the military decommissioned them, and NASA thought, let's buy a few of these out uh, and um, reconfigure them. So what they did was they added this nose turret thing that you see here um, that you can put instrumentation in. We have cameras in there. Um, you can see that it can turn around, right? So the, so the pilot will fly uh, along the eclipse path above the clouds. He'll orient that front nose cone to point in the right direction. As he's flying, it can move to track the sun. Um, and you are kind of guaranteed to get good weather. Um, so one way is to put your stuff on the front of the front of the plane. The other way is to what NCAR did is buy a super high-end luxury jet, rip out all the cool stuff inside, and just cram some instrumentation in there, right? So that's what they did here. This is this is like the kind of if you've seen Succession, this is the kind of planes they fly around in, right? But they've got nice, comfy couches and beds. NCAR has all this crap. 
So what, what they do is um, they have all the instrumentation that they need to observe the eclipse and then have a really precise pointing system with mirrors that makes sure they look through a little hole that they drilled in the kind of fuselage at the top that points towards the sun. Uh, this is a little bit different from that nose cone situation. Right? That nose cone could move, right? The aircraft can't, like, you can't change where the, where the window is, right? So you have to get a little bit creative in how you fly. The pilot might have to kind of tilt it a little bit. Um, but these are some of the things that we're, we're doing for uh, the eclipse in 2024. We're flying the NCAR aircraft to take observations. And this is uh, one of the observations from the 2017 eclipse. This aircraft flew. And this is someone that was on board, kind of put their iPhone out the window to see what you can see, right? Um, and you can see that there are, the clouds here would have been a problem for them, right? They're above the clouds, but it's, it's really interesting to see like the shadow come across and how, how different it looks when the eclipse comes. So let's get to the eclipse then, the upcoming eclipses. Um, let's start with how many people here have seen an eclipse? Okay, how many people here have seen a total solar eclipse? I would say like about half of the people in the audience. Um, and so I want to talk a little bit about what to expect when you see one. And I want to try and encourage people that have not seen one to make an effort to see a total solar eclipse. I think most people here that have seen a total solar eclipse will try really hard to see the next one, right? And that's kind of the best advert for it in my mind. It's like, it's, it's not just one of those things where, eh, I've seen it. It's like, that was cool. I'm going to try again and again and again. Uh, so the next one that's coming up is in October this year, but it's an annular solar eclipse, right? It won't be the same as a total solar eclipse. There's still, you still see some of that bright photosphere. The next one you really want to care about is in April next year is the total solar eclipse. And that's the one you can see the path of here. Yeah, starts over Mexico, goes all the way across the US and makes it to Canada. This is, a, this is an image I stole from, from NASA. And for some reason, Mexico and Canada are completely under clouds, but <laughs> But the US is clear. I don't know if that's kind of NASA's problem. So anyway, choose where you think is going to have the best viewing conditions and go there. OK, so what can we expect to see at the 2024 eclipse? Um, sometimes there are planets in the field of view of the sun. Uh, obviously, in the normal daytime sky, you don't see the planets. The sun is too bright. It drowns them out. But, but during an eclipse, you can see, in this case, uh, we saw Mercury and Jupiter. Something really cool about the 2024 20, eclipse next year is that there's, always, there's also going to be a comet in the field of view. Now, this is an artist's impression. It won't look like this. Right? I am the artist in this case. And I think I did a pretty good job, but it's probably going to be a little bit smaller than that. Um, but this lets me kind of transition to something else. I'll, it's kind of in the same theme as what we're talking about is the eclipse is cool, but what is really cool about it to me is what it teaches me about the sun. And that's the same for comets, right? Comets are a cool thing, but what is more interesting is what it can teach me about the sun itself. I don't really care about the comet so much. Um, the fact that we see a comet in the field of view near the eclipse, it's actually not that uncommon. There are thousands of comets. Like, they're often passing pretty close to the sun. And this is just an animation of, over the years, how many comets have come in uh, close contact with the sun. Most of the time, though, these comets are really small. And they, they burn up. We don't see, like, if they get close enough to the sun, they burn up and they fizzle out. You don't see them. A few years ago, we kind of got lucky. And one of these comets uh, was big enough and close enough to the sun to be able to see with the coronagraph, right? With the fake sun image. And this is what it looked like. This is, this is uh, a coronagraph image from space. You can see the sun's in the middle. Um, and you can see like the occulting disk, the fake moon is bigger than the sun. So you don't see all the way down to where the sun is. But look at this one. This comet came in. Usually it would burn up, but it survived and it came back out. Right? 
So when we went to some different instrumentation that looks close up in the sun, it looks in a different wavelength of light, it looks in ultraviolet, and we looked at it really close again, right? If, if the comet's not here, what does this image of the corona he out here look like? It looks boring, it looks like there's nothing there, right? When the comet comes through, it releases all this material, all the material gets, gets sublimated off because of the sunlight. And that material gets dumped into the atmosphere and then starts moving around in all these weird shapes that you might not predict. This is, this is on the other side of the sun, right? The sun's here. This is, it's, it's been around the backside and come out again, and it's doing the same thing. And if I kind of process this image and show it in a different way so that um, I, we kind of just, um, instead of, um, I, I, I keep the light from the comet as it moves through. You can see all of the, like, the the striations, it kind of maps out. Um, and this goes back to when I spoke about can we measure the magnetic field on the sun. That's, what's, that's what we're, we're really seeing here. Our, our original image doesn't show anything about the magnetic field, but when the comet goes through, it releases this material. That material is influenced by the magnetic field, and instead of flowing along the same orbit that the comet was going, it gets, it's like your fridge magnet. It says, oh, there's a fridge over there. Pew! It goes that direction, right? And it goes in all different directions. So it shows you in some places the magnetic field's pointing this way, and some it's pointing that way. And that helps us know what the corona is like magnetically and eventually how that magnetism impacts life on Earth. Um, so this is, this is kind of like a map of here is a model of what we think the magnetic field might look like around the sun. Here's what the comet did, and we can test if our model is correct or not. Okay, so something else you might see um, in the eclipse is uh, Bailey's beads. I think m most people have probably heard of this. Um, so why do you see that? It's called Bailey's beads, right? And that's when there's another image after this one that shows you when the moon goes in front of the sun, it doesn't just cover it smoothly. You get little pinpoints of light. And the reason for that is that the moon is not a perfect sphere, right? There's all these craters on it. Um, and We've measured this. There's, uh, this is images from the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter that measures very precisely the landscape of the moon. And then in blue around the moon, you see like an um, exaggerated version of where, it's ha where the moon has valleys and peaks. And, you see, and, you, and you'll see that during the eclipse. So let's see what happens as the moon, you, as the moon kind of gets closer and closer to cover, you see these little dots, right? And that's the sunlight coming through the little valleys on the moon. Um, the, another kind of cool thing you see is in red here, that's what we call prominence material. That's kind of material that is between the surface of the sun and the corona. It's like a transition region between the two. Um, and that's where a lot of that um, explosive events kind of come from. Okay, so I'm kind of coming towards the end. This is, I kind of, like I said, I wanted to convince people that have not seen a total solar eclipse to go and see one. Um, and I, I'm a super cynical person, right? <laughs> before, before the, the first eclipse I saw was 2017. I went to talks like this, and people were saying, oh, you have to go and see the total solar eclipse. If you haven't seen one, you haven't lived, right? And I'm like, uh, sure. I think it'll be cool, but it's not really worth traveling for. Um, but after I saw one, I was kind of a convert, right? <laughs> it's like, you, you can show people images of the eclipse, what it looks like, um, but it doesn't convey what it's like. I, kind of compare, I like to compare it to the Grand Canyon. You can see a picture of the Grand Canyon, right? Eh. <laughs> or you can go to the Grand Canyon and you're like, oh my God, this is amazing. It's the same for an eclipse for me because it's, it's not just it's not just the image, right? It's not just, it's not just the sun not being there. It gets dark, it gets cold. Uh, animals kind of go crazy. They think it's nighttime, should I go to bed? Uh, but then four minutes later, they're up again, uh, which actually happens quite often in my house. But, um, <laughs> so I, I think the best way to um, convey how cool it is is to show you an, a movie that the National Solar Observatory took of people observing the eclipse in 2017 here in the US. And I want you to concentrate 
On this little boy here, right? What's his what's his reaction when the when it gets dark? Thank you very much. That was super fun. Um, just saying that. Um, if we have questions in house, please raise your hand. And Olia, who is actually here, see, told you she existed, will bring the mic to y'all. So, how about a satellite? to uh, do the same sort of thing as opposed to airplanes. Wouldn't that capture a lot of the solar weather? Uh, yes, and we do that, right? So that image I showed you of the comet, that was from a satellite. Um, it still has the same problem um, in that the occulting disk, so the fake moon, is still, it's not as far away as the moon is, right? It's, it's still in their instrument, it's still close, right? So, so there's still scattered light effects. One really, Interesting idea that will fly next year is a, is, a, is a new concept where instead of having a telescope with that occulting disk attached to the end of the telescope, they're going to fly two spacecraft, right? The one spacecraft will be up, the other one will fly some kilometers away, uh, so you get the distance and that's, uh, but it's very difficult, like from a technology point of view, to make sure those two spacecraft are lined up perfectly, so it's, so it's it's an engineering like problem that's very difficult, but they think they can do it, and that mission is going to launch next year, hopefully. I may have misunderstood, uh, quite possibly, but at the very beginning, you were talking about the corona being hotter than the surface of the sun, something to do with magnetism. I didn't see why magnetism would make it hotter. Well, that's why I directed you to Rebecca's talk, which is a, which is a whole different explorer can talk, you right? Summarize? But I can summarize. Uh, the, the quick answer is, we don't know. The, the better answer is that there are a lot of different things going on in the sun that we think can, well, so to get, the, to get the atmosphere hot, what you need to do is move that energy up into the, into the atmosphere, right? And, and so, the, so the question is, how do you move that energy up? Um, there are a lot of different mechanisms that could do it. Um, the, the sun is not like a static, nice, steady body, right? There's lots of movement going on, right? So you get a lot of waves generated in the atmosphere. Um, it's, a it's a little bit like waves you see in the sea, but they're um, in the atmosphere it's instead. And they can push that energy up into the higher atmosphere. So that's one theory of how that, how that heat gets up. Um, yes, but it's a little bit different because the atmosphere of the sun is very... Uh, tenuous, right? So friction doesn't really play a big role because there's not enough particles there to rub against each other. Everything's more is further apart. Um, so there are other processes that can maybe be responsible, but we don't really know. There's still a very active um, region of research. I'm going to take a question online. Sorry. Um, I'm going to bring up the question from Slido. What is the prognosis for weather across Texas for April of 2024? <laughs> since, you know. That's a good question. The, so there are people that spend, like, as their career is predicting what the weather is going to be like for any given eclipse. Um, the most reliable way that they think to do this is just to look at that same day over the last 20 years and give you an average cloud cover for that day. So the average cloud cover over the last 20 years tells me that 
the best place to be is as as well. The best place to be is Mexico, right? Um, if you need to stay in the U.S., the best place to be is as far south in Texas as you can get. Um, but I will add this caveat. So if you don't take the last 20 years, if you just take last uh, this year, April 8th this year, it's the exact opposite, right? <laughs> Texas was terrible. Ohio was awesome. So uh, who knows? Question. Um, so Dr. Walter Roberts started High Altitude Observatory in Colorado. Mm -hmm. He said it's decommissioned. Mauna Loa now is carrying on. Is the High Altitude Observatory in Hawaii or in Colorado? Uh, both. So the High Altitude Observatory was founded in, the 19, in 1940, right, with, at Climax. Then they invented NCAR, right? which is more than just the High Altitude Observatory. The High Altitude Observatory was to observe the sun. But when NCAR came along, they wanted to do the Earth's atmosphere. They wanted to do much more, right? So it's everything from the sun all the way to the Earth. So what they did then was make HAO part of NCAR. So HAO is the part of NCAR that still studies the sun. There are other divisions within NCAR that study climate on Earth. They study tornadoes, etc. cetera. So, um, the eight, so HEO now is here in Boulder, but also in, we also have a, we don't do any observing here because the observing conditions are not as great as up on top of a mountain in Hawaii. So we also have a, our team in Hawaii, so we're both. Yeah, so Hawaii is where we do the observations. Boulder is where most of the scientists work. Hello, does the ISS experience eclipses any different from people on the ground? Um, good question. I think they're, so they're a little bit, they're a little bit closer to, this, to the moon, right? If, in the, if, if the moon were between them and the sun. Uh, so so, um, so that, that might vary, like sometimes they might see a total eclipse when Earth might only see an annular, for instance. Uh, but I think that, but that difference is, is really small, so I think it probably doesn't make a big difference. What is really cool about the ISS is they can see the eclipse happening on the Earth, right? So they can look down on the Earth and see the shadow move across the Earth, uh, and that's, that's kind of like that slide I had up before is, is actually is not a real image, it's a simulation, but it's the same thing that they see, and the astronauts have taken movies of that and showed they're not experiencing the eclipse themselves. They're kind of offset a little bit, but they can see the moon's shadow moving across the Earth. What was my question? <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. Do you have a sense of what the volunteers will be doing um, who volunteer mm -hmm. uh, at this next solar eclipse? And second question is, when will the following one after 2024 be? Wh when and where? I'll answer your first question first. Okay. Um, there are different types of volunteers, right? We've got 35 of those stations along the eclipse path. What we're doing is having regional coordinators who are volunteers that are kind of um, in charge of eight or nine of them. So there's four regional coordinators and they are kind of overseeing eight, eight, eight of those individual sites. But then at the individual site itself, there will be people that will be operating the instrument. So that means you need to go and point it in the right place, uh, set all the software up to take the data at the right time. Um, and there's a lot of training in advance. And we're providing the training, right, to, to help, because we want the volunteers not already to be experts. We are kind of trying to engage the public and have people that may be interested in astronomy get hands-on like experience of doing this. So we're providing a lot of, um, it, training for them to be able to operate the instrument, not just for the eclipse, but in the future. Tell them how to be able to take this telescope out and observe the night sky. But when the eclipse happens, do they, do they have enough time to go out and observe themselves, or do, do they look at the instruments themselves? That's one of the troubles of going to see an eclipse if you're actually taking I, th I think um, it's better sometimes not to be bothering with your telescope, right? Just go and enjoy it. Uh, but. Yeah, a, a, a lot of it depends how automated it is, and these things are pretty well automated. Once you get it lined up in the right place, you kind of press a button before the eclipse happens, and it does it all for you. So then you can kind of sit in your deck chair and enjoy.
Yes. Are you going to answer the second? Oh, sorry. <laughs> the second question is the next eclipse um, anywhere on Earth is in 2026, and it will pass over Iceland, uh, then across the Atlantic, and eventually Spain. Um, the next eclipse in the US will not be till 2045, and it will come right across Colorado. Uh, so, yeah. Maintain a healthy lifestyle. You've got 20 years. We had another, okay. Will the volunteers be able to pick up the telescopes and move to a place where the weather is clear if necessary? No, and we deliberately don't want them to do that, right? Because, well, we've got around that fact by placing these telescopes all along the eclipse path so that there's overlap, right? If, if, um, if one telescope doesn't take successful observations, it might be because of clouds, but it might just be because something else goes wrong with the, with the instrumentation. The, the next observation over is close enough that it will also see the same thing, right? So there's uninterrupted coverage even if one goes down. If two in a row go down, then okay, we're stuffed. But the other answer to that is, it's very difficult to predict what the cloud cover will be like in advance with enough time to move. Even if you think it's going to be cloudy, lots of the times when, you, when the eclipse starts to happen, because the temperature changes, the cloud cover changes, like things happen in the atmosphere differently, and oftentimes it's cloudy and then suddenly the clouds move. So we don't really want people, yeah. Hello. Uh, so I heard the relativity, like the light bending, was proven by the total uh, eclipse. Mm -hmm. And I was curious that, to me, it didn't look like the like light was bending there. So uh, I was uh, wondering what's uh, was over with that. Yeah, that's the, that's a, that's an excellent an other example of the eclipse teaching us about something else, right? Which is kind of the theme I was going for here. So that was. Einstein's theory of general relativity. What he said was, if light travels past some massive body, something with a lot of gravity, like the sun, the light doesn't travel in a straight line anymore. It bends because gravity bends light. Um, but uh, that was Einstein's kind of theory that he um, had never actually been tested. And the person who tested it first was Eddington, um, and it was during a solar eclipse. So how he did it was um, there was a there was stars, or one bright star, um, behind the sun, right? It was kind of, not, not directly behind the sun, but just kind of offset from it. Um, during daylight, you wouldn't be able to see that star, right? The sun was too bright, you couldn't see the star. During an eclipse, you, the sunlight got dim and you could see the star through the corona. So they knew where that star should be, right? because you could observe that same star at night. So they know where it should be. Then they measured it where it was during the eclipse and they saw it was actually offset a little bit. And that means that the light coming from that star when it passed by the sun bent a little bit so that it wasn't where you think it is. We have an online question. Um, let's bring it up. But in the meantime is, will we be able to see the corona during October's annual eclipse? No. Uh, and I think so October's annular eclipse um, still leaves a portion of the sun, right? And I think the best way to understand why you wouldn't see the corona is the, the corona is a million times dimmer than the photosphere, the surface of the sun. So if I, if I block out 90% of the photosphere, that's still 10% of a million is still a lot. Right? It's still way brighter than the corona. So that's why you really need to get to total solar eclipse before you can see the corona. If the sky is clear and weather conditions are therefore be op optimal for watching, is every solar eclipse experience pretty much the same the way it looks? Or is it a different experience every time for whatever reason? I think it's different because it's not, to me, it's not just about what's happening in the sky, right? It's happening, it's what's happening on Earth is, is more interesting in some sense. When, uh, 
When Evie gave the introduction, she said that for the 2019 eclipse, I went to a mountaintop in Chile to observe it. And that one was really cool because from the mountaintop, you can see the sea, right? Chile is really narrow, right? So I think you can see the sea from basically everywhere in Chile. But when you're high up like that, you could see the shadow of the moon coming across the sea towards us, right? So we knew the eclipse was coming before it got there. Um, we were messing around with our telescope and getting everything right, but you could kind of, you could see it coming towards you and then it happened. So that's specific to that location, right? And, it's, and that's the same for other locations have their own kind of specific cool things happening. It's very different if it's high in the sky compared to on the horizon. You, it's kind of, it'll be like a different experience. So, yeah. Okay, just to give y'all a chance to think, let me ask you my favorite question, which is if there are any students that are online watching this, what advice do you, do you give them if they want to have a career in what you're doing right now? Um, number one, make sure you get a passport, right? Because eclipses <laughs> happen all over the place. <laughs> More importantly, I would say do something you're interested in doing, right? If you think this is interesting, I think that you, that, I think that's the best way to motivate yourself to learn, to be able to become, like what I do as a solar scientist. So I studied physics um, at university, but you don't need to study that to get involved in solar science and eclipse science. There's many different um, aspects to it. Um, engineering is a big one, right? When you look at these telescopes, I didn't go into any detail of it, but these are not simple things to build, right? And we have a team of like kind of well-trained engineers. So if you're, you don't need to be a scientist. If you're an engineer, you can um, get involved in instrumentation. Um, computer science is a big thing. A lot of, uh, when we look at the data from the sun, it needs to be interpreted and a lot of computer uh, machine learning and artificial intelligence is kind of a big kind of buzz topic right now. Um, you're kind of more used to seeing it in the terms of like chat GPT or something, but it can be useful in interpreting solar images as well. So there's lots of different avenues to get involved. And you have mentioned that there are like 35 sites for next mm -hmm. year. Where are you gonna be? What are you gonna be doing? I am still undecided, but probably uh, somewhere in South Texas where the weather has the best chance of being good. So tell us a little bit more about the corona. When you look at the solar eclipse, you see like beams coming mm. out. Outside of that beam, is it still a million times warmer than the than the sun's surface or yeah. is it very or? Yeah, it's kind of, it's interesting, right? It's kind of, it goes back to that uh, campfire analogy where if it was just a fire, everything would be the same as you go out. It would all be kind of very smooth, but it's not the case with the corona. You see different structures. Um, and yes, it's still a million-ish degrees, but the temperature varies, right? There's, it's not, there's not, the corona doesn't have one single temperature. It has a whole, it's, it's on average roughly about a million, but it can go up to 10 million maybe in some like regions. Um, so you see some, temperature variation in the in the structures you see there, but most of that structure is determined by the magnetic field, right? So all of the material in the corona is, is ionized, right? So that means that it's so hot that the electrons have been stripped off of the atoms. So it gets, so it experiences the magnetic field. So when the magnetic field is oriented in a certain direction, the material kind of moves in that direction. And that's a lot of the reason why you see some parts brighter than others because there's more density in some regions than in other places. I'm going to ask you a question that's gonna be like choosing your favorite child, but out of all of the eclipse experiences you have had, which one is your favorite? I've only had two, right? I mean, it's so, two, so you have to pick one. Um, I will choose the first one because it was unexpected to me. Um, not from a science point of view, it was unexpected from a experience point of view. I kind of, like I said before, I thought it would be cool, but not that great. And I think that was the one that kind of let me realize, okay, this is, this is something really, it's, it's, um, it's a natural phenomenon, but it feels unnatural, right? There's something kind of weirdly alien about it. Um, I have a very weird question. Um, so I, if the sun, it's a gas. 
What does it mean that there is a solar surface? What, where's the surface? What's the yeah, I mean, it's not, a, it's not a surface in the sense that you think of the Earth having a solid surface, right? Um, the sun is, is gas-like, it's not quite a gas, right? It's, it's kind of gone into what we call a plasma, where, um, um, so the difference between a solid and a liquid and a gas is like the, the molecules or atoms are far enough apart that it's, that it's tenuous, it's not dense anymore. But the plasma goes beyond that, where the atoms themselves start to come apart. Um, the electrons come away from the, the nucleus of the atom. So, um, so it's a gas in the sense of it's tenuous, uh, but it's also driven by the magnetic field. So the surface of the sun basically just means, um, it's not a solid surface, it's just where the, the light we see comes from, right? Up anything below that, all the light that's coming from below that gets, uh, doesn't escape the sun. It, gets, it kind of gets, bounces around inside the sun and never gets out. Um, once it gets to that photosphere surface, then it travels all the way to Earth. Cool. Um, if there are no more questions, um, let's just all take a second and thank Paul for this amazing lecture. So let's just give a hand to Paul. Um, and honestly, thank you all for attending this lecture on total solar eclipses. That is part of our Explorer series. Uh, we have one coming up in September 13th. And it's going to be all about field campaigns that start with an idea, collecting all the data, and I was promised pictures of penguins. So there will be penguins in the talk. Uh, yeah. Um, so if you are interested in more NCAR Explorer series events, check out our website um, for upcoming lectures and conversations. And if you want to relive this, there will be a recording of all past events, including Paul's. Um, you are going to receive an email um, so if you are 18 years or older, please take a moment to fill our survey that helps us understand the impact of the program and how we can improve our next event. The survey will close on Tuesday, September 5th, so you can have Labor Day off. Um, you can find that survey by scanning a QR code or you can ask um, either Ali or I um, if you would like to take the survey using our iPads. I hope to see you all next time and have a lovely rest of your night. Thank you for coming. Thank you.